All right, we're on to project three, and I recorded this tutorial already, but the microphone wasn't working, so here we go again. Uh, we're doing predictive modeling in project three. We're going to talk about data fusion using the map calculator and doing map series in another practicum, but I thought I'd start with this one because it makes a little bit of sense in terms of the order for project three, which here's the project three. Um, text file and it starts with interpolation so let's start our practicum series with interpolation now the only thing you got to do is to download this trace21k.zip file it's uh, going to be a set of paleoclimatology uh, spatial paleoclimatology models and I have done the hard part of importing them into grass and clipping them to the right size for Wadi Hassa so this is actually a grass map set that's zipped up so when you download it you want to download it into the um, grass database that contains your Wadi Hassa WGS84 UTM Zone 36 North grass location. And you want to put that zip file in where all the map sets are. So these are the map sets we were working with with Project 2. Put that in there and then right click extract here. And this new folder, Trace21K, is the grass map set. And so if we go uh, into grass and we get into that location. You might not initially see this, but if you hit the refresh button like so, uh, it will definitely find the new folder. And uh, what I want you to do is to just go ahead and uh, you can uh, either go into this map set or you can make yourself uh, a new map set in the current location, which I'll just call interpolation. So there we go and make sure that uh, that is the current map set that you're in and here's our map display over here and you can see I already loaded in the Wadi Hassa 30 meter SRT I'm just as the backdrop okay so uh, what we'll want to do is to just get started as normal go to our working environment map set access make sure that trace 21k is av uh, available and you don't necessarily need these other ones to be available right now, so they'll just sort of get in the way, so I'll leave them invisible for the time being. The first thing that I am going to do is to go ahead and add in, these are all raster maps in the Trace21K, so I'm gonna add in uh, one of these maps, and I wanna show you we have uh, a whole bunch of them in there. Uh, CHELSA is the name of the organization, Trace21K is the particular paleoclimate model, it's global, goes back to 21,000 years ago, which is why the 21K is. And uh, there's a variety of climate variables that it maps at a global scale. Um, the ones that I downloaded were the annual precipitation, AP, and the mean annual temperature, MAT. And I did it at 2K years ago, 5K years ago, 8K, 12K, 15, and 22, covering the late Upper Paleolithic, the Epi Paleolithic the sort of uh, uh, transition to the early PPNA or Neolithic in this area, the PPMB, uh, sort of Calcolithic, Bronze Age transition, and then finally the sort of classic world, Roman, Byzantine, Nabataean time frame. So let's just load in one of these things. Let's get the annual precipitation map for 2,000 years ago, and we'll load it up here. And the first thing you're going to notice is that the resolution is very coarse. Now these are Nominally, uh, because it's a global data set, it's in uh, degrees, minutes, seconds. When you translate it, it's almost a kilometer resolution, 877 square meters. Um, when I did this, I could have changed the resolution and brought it in at that, but I left it at 30 meters so I could show you very specifically when I zoom in that we have these pixels. This is the resolution of the data, but you'll notice Actually, if I right click on this and hit metadata, it says it's 30 by 30 because I left the resolution at 30 when I initially imported this data and reprojected it. So technically it's a 30 by 30 meter data set, but the original resolution is actually 877 meters. And if you don't believe me, I'll get the measure distance tool and as close as I can, I will draw across. And uh, you know, in this case, it's I didn't, maybe didn't get it exactly right, but 782.9. So it's somewhere in the realm of 800 or so meters, nominally about uh, a kilometer at the equator and changes because it's degrees, minutes, seconds as you go north. So yeah, it's 30 meters, but it's not 30 meters because it's originally a coarser data set. 
This is why we're going to use this for interpolation because if I go back over here, uh, you know, our actual Wadi Hasa data set is a native 30 meter resolution and uh, obviously when we're doing our final predictive model we would like to work at that 30 meter resolution. It would be nicer if we could work at that resolution because this circle 1K is very, very, very coarse in terms of real details on the ground. So if I had brought this data in uh, truly at 877 meters or whatever the actual ground resolution is, we could uh, set the resolution to 30, go into this pretty simple resampling, pick one of these methods and, uh, and it would work. And that's a perfectly fine way to do this. But I want to show you how these methods actually work uh, from the ground up. So we're going to do it manually. And because I uh, did it so that I imported it actually technically at 30 meter resolution, we're going to have to do a couple different steps to sort of replicate, if I had done it the right way, <laughs> how it would work. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to just zoom all the way out so we can see the whole area. And then we're going to go to Settings, Computational Region, and Set Region G Region. And uh, the first thing that we are going to do is nominally set the resolution to that, uh, I believe it's 877. It should work even if it's not exact, right? Uh, because what we want to do is to sample this uh, at, at the original resolution, not at 30 meter resolution, because we'll get a bunch of duplicate samples in each big uh, grid square uh, if we did that. So we'll hit run. And just to show you, we'll hit print the current region. And uh, there we go. So we set the region. It, it's not exactly 877 because it's trying to align with the, the current grid, but you know it should be pretty close to it, like so. And we are going to randomly, randomly sample, but we're going to pick a random sample at every single grid square. So we're going to have 100% coverage. Remember, we're doing this at a much coarser resolution. Uh, so even though this has a bunch of 30 meter pixels, it's just going to put a point in the middle of our original coarse grid squares. And to do that, we go to raster, uh, and then we go down to um, generate random cells, and we pick the one that says R random, uh, random cells and vector points. So we want to make sure we pick our Chelsea map, the 21K, whatever variable. You're going to do this for at least two variables, hopefully. And uh, at this particular point we have to check we want to do a random seed you could set a specific seed but since we're doing 100% coverage it doesn't really matter uh, and here's where we tell it to do 100% you could enter a total number of like let's say you just wanted 10,000 or 100,000 you could do it like that but conveniently to do a proportional sample you could just add a percentage onto it so between 0 and 100 in this case 100 means that at every 877 you know or whatever it is squared it'll put a point in the middle of it like so and we're going to make an output vector map and we're going to call it uh, in fact what we'll do is we'll just copy the name and we'll paste that here and we'll put 100p for percent sample it's going to be a vector points map and at this point we can hit run and uh, put, make sure that goes on top and you can see that there's a, a vector point within each of these squares more or less close enough for, for our particular work here. And the next thing we want to do is to go back to G region and uh, we want to reset the resolution. The easiest way to do this to make sure everything lines up is to make sure it matches our base Wadi Hasa map. So on the existing tab we'll just put the region to match this raster map and we can see if we've got the, the print button checked um, we'll be able to see that it's 30. Otherwise, we could go back up to this uh, computational region and we can do just show the region. It will show it there. So at this particular point, uh, we have our sample of points from our course data set. We have reset the resolution to 30. We need to pick our interpolation method. And uh, there's a variety of them down here in the interpolate services, raster interpolate services. I'm going to show you two. Uh, the IDW is for uh, technically for um, uh, data that's not that doesn't need to be really continuous, so it's really great for discrete data sets, categorical data sets. I'll just show you what it actually looks like. I'll use IDW from vector points, and we'll pick our 100% sample, and uh, I will copy that in there and do IDW 
30M, so I know what I'm doing. We pick the value column in the data table um, because our uh, R random uh, has created a column called value where it pulled the value from the underlying raster and put it into this column for each individual point. So that's what we're going to interpolate right there. And uh, we can change some parameters. We can make the window bigger. We could change the power parameter to change the character of the IDW equation. And again, you can look at the manual to read all about uh, the impact of those things. I'm going to leave the defaults for now. I'm going to hit run. And this uh, will take a little bit of time, so I'm just going to quickly pause the video while it's doing it. Actually, while that's running, I think I'll just do the, uh, the second one. So I'll leave this down here in the corner, um, and we'll get an IDW interpolation out of this. But the one that we really want to do for this kind of continuous data is some sort of uh, splying method. Um, uh, Krieging would be fine, but GRASS doesn't have it. Um, we have two different splying methods, RST, which used to be the only method, and now a much quicker one that does something similar called vSurf B-spline. And that's the one that we're going to use in our class here. So because I have this selected in the layer menu, it pre-selected my input vector points. That's fine. Uh, in the settings, we'll pick our same value column to interpolate. Here we do have to tell it the spline step in east-west direction. For a regular grid of points, it can be the basic average distance between them. In our case, it'd be about 877. But let's just go ahead and make it a little bit bigger at 1,000 just to be safe. We tell it we want to do the most smooth method, which is by cubic. Again, it just changes the complexity of the equation. And then we have the smoothing parameter here, which uh, is where you get to do a little bit more experimentation. If you were going to do this very rigorously, we want to go to the optional tab, zoom in, set a small region, and find a cross, uh, you know, a, a, an optimal smoothing parameter using this cross validation method and you can read about that in the manual but because we have a regular grid and we're interpolating it um, we're going to uh, basically leave the smoothing value the same essentially the smaller it is the closer the actual surface will pass through the original data points the bigger it is the sort of tighter the surface will be it will be smoother but it may be deviate from your real data points but uh, i'm going to leave the default value in here for now because it will do a decent uh, decent job. And uh, I'm going to put in the name. Again, I had that already copied, so I pasted it back in. Here I'm going to do uh, bspline 30m, right? So I know what is going on here. And there's a few other uh, you know, uh, parameters you could check, but we don't necessarily need to, uh, to do that in our particular uh, case here. The only thing I will do is increase my memory. The bigger it is, the faster it goes. So 3 gigs is going to be good for us. Looks like our IDW completed and you'll see that the B-spline is actually going to go faster than the IDW even though the uh, equation is more complex simply because this is a more optimized module in GRASS. So in the background we have all of these things lined up. So what I'm going to do is just show you the original then uh, I'll show you the IDW, which you can see is smoother. It's interpolated better than the basic, just changed the value of the resolution to 30 that we did initially. But you can still see the square patterning. So it didn't do a great job in it. Maybe if we increased the neighborhood size, we would have gotten a smoother result possible. And then finally, the B spline is very smooth indeed. And uh, here, if we add our raster legend, for that, B spline, okay. Um, we can see these, are, by the way, are millimeters of rainfall. We can see the patterns. Again, the original data is still coarse at about a kilometer square uh, resolution, but we have interpolated a finer patterning, which will look nicer when we do our final model when we want to incorporate this information here. So again, that's the nuts and bolts of doing interpolation. In our case, we did it to uh, interpolate uh, a finer resolution. And again, there are some specific tools which you can read about in the raster develop map for, for resampling. And in, in there, we also have nearest neighbor and some other statistical methods. So you might want to use some of those. But I think it's useful to do it the old school way. This particular one, it's not too difficult to do. And you get a better sense of what it's really doing. Let me show you one final example of interpolation. 
And uh, this particular case, let me add in our uh, Hasa sites. And we're going to interpolate a value. We don't have anything particularly meaningful in the tables with this. Like if there was artifact densities, that'd be great. But we have some numerical values like length and width of the site that we can interpolate just to show you how it works. And what we're going to want to do is to limit the area because anywhere where you don't have data, interpolation is going to be meaningless anyway. So the first thing I'm going to do is to create a convex hull around the area that we have points. So we'll go to vector and we will go to generate area from points, convex hull v dot hull. We'll just call this our uh, WHS sites hull, like so. We will hit run, and we have this hull right here. Um, what you'll notice is that the uh, hull is very tightly fitted to the uh, region that the sites are in, so we want to give a little bit of breathing space around this. Let's give it a buffer of a kilometer or two. So we'll just go back into here, we'll do V buffer. We have our uh, hull selected. And we'll call this, yes, I know I've got something i got to do soon. We'll call this the hull buff, like so. And we'll just add a distance of 2,000 uh, meters to do so. We'll hit run. And we have our nice big, uh, nice buffer around our sites uh, now. Let's go ahead and convert that to a raster file with vector to rast from the map type conversions menu. And we have our whole buff and we'll just do the same thing over here. And uh, we'll just pick a value and in the optional, you can see the val is one. So it'll make a map of all ones and null where it doesn't exist. So we'll hit run. And there we go. So now we actually have a, a raster map. And now when we go back into our uh, vSurf B spline, we can go back to the required tab, we'll enter our uh, WHS sites uh, under uh, settings. Um, you know, we'll have to change the, the spline step. Probably we'll want to go to 10 kilometers because this is a much sparser data set than our regular grid. So we'll go to 10,000 uh, 10, meters in each direction. We'll leave the rest the same here. Here we'll call it um, Hasa sites length, just because that's what we're going to do. Um, we have to, ooh, where's our uh, column value? Is going to be max length over here. And then on the optional tab, we'll use this mask masking uh, file will pick our um, what we say, WHS sites hull buff and we'll just hit run really quickly and it's going to do it only within the area where there's data in the mask file and so uh, this is our output here and if we change our um, our legend here for the Hasa sites length we'll get the value in length sites. And you can see that as you get to areas where there's not that many sites, the interpolation is not going to be as, as useful. The model is going to be a lot longer. But we've got a nice continuous surface of that particular numerical value. So that's where I'm going to stop. Uh, basic, basic interpolation and for project three, you're mainly going to just do the resampling to get your climate data to the finer resolution.